Swinburne University of Technology. So just to begin with, I guess um, I wanted to start off with just a little video on what is VR from Samsung's perspective. Samsung has made the exciting world of virtual reality a reality with Gear VR Innovator Edition. Powered by Oculus and the Galaxy Note 4, Gear VR is a virtual reality headset that lets you experience games, movies, and more like never before. You simply insert the Galaxy Note 4 into place and put it on. Then select Milk VR and get ready for the DMA. You're going to want some serious sound. Whoa. What a view. Gear VR plunges you into a totally immersive 360 environment. What do you think? Feels like I'm really there. You can see things from a whole new perspective. Ready for another adventure? Navigate menus, explore worlds, and play games by simply turning your head, swiping, and tapping the side mounted touchpad. Now I'm on safari. Gear VR brings the experience to life. Where are you? I'm in a really intense battle. Take that. Whoa. Looks like the best seat in the house. Up, down, side, side, even behind you. Everywhere you look in the action. All happens on the Super AMOLED screen on the Galaxy Note 4. The world of virtual reality is finally here. The Samsung Gear VR Innovator Edition is the Oculus yeah. and the Galaxy Note 4. Great. Um, so that's a little, uh, just a quick show of hands. Who's ever um, put on a pair of virtual reality goggles before, right? So. About half of us? OK, so you haven't actually had that immersive experience. And what you get when you put on VR is that you, know, you put them on and you're, you're absolutely within. Uh, you look every direction you look, you're in the center of things. So fully immersive 3D. Um, we also, uh, with ours, you can, uh, of course, the sound as well can be completely all enveloping. Um, we, as far as Samsung's perspective, oh, that's the wrong slide. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go to the slideshow. Sorry. Okay. Slight technical. That, that's the one. Sorry, everybody. Perfect. Sorry, this is some of uh, covering for Stefan. Uh, so, probably a couple of things to note as far as virtual reality is a lot of it has been, there was a lot of talk around Second Life several years ago and virtual worlds and what's all virtual mean. Technology has been moving very quickly, and, and with the Gear VR, we released this uh, this year in February. And what's exciting is that it's actually harnessing the power of this and the accessibility of this, which is a phone. The kind of computing power you're going to get in here, even a few years ago, that's what was in a laptop. So it's harnessing the power, screen resolution, to make VR truly portable, accessible, and used in a variety of environments. Now. That video we saw to begin with is, is sort of more of a consumer environment. What we're here today is to talk about VR and education. Uh, Stefan's favorite expression is that it's the Wild West right now. And it certainly is, because I think it's, there is, there's so much potential and so much opportunity with VR. And that you know, we, there is so many ways in which it can be seen in classroom environments. Uh, it could be used in university marketing. It could be used in a variety of ways across institutions to actually really uh, start harnessing VR. Um, so the, the headset itself looks like this. What's different about this is there's a few different ones in the model. Some of you might be um, know Google Cardboard or have seen Google Cardboard before, right? So it's just goes on. Uh, you have some, oh, you might have heard of it. Uh, and here's something I prepared earlier. Uh, so there's Google Cardboard. What's different about the, um, the Gear VR is that it's been done in partnership with Oculus and it actually has gyroscopic sensors built in. So there's quite a lot of technology built in there, both for in terms of input, and you saw in the video, you can switch and reverse and go through. It has eye tracking, but when you get into those immersive experience in terms of actually tracking your head and what's going on and how, how you're moving, it's, it's seamless and you actually feel like you're right in there. So it's very accurate. And, the sort of implications for how it can be used becomes a lot, there's a lot more potential with that. Um, just go to the next slide, please. So 
just in terms of specifications of the device itself, so it has that optical field of view, so it's a very wide frame of view. They, it's something like this. There's my technical approximation of the kind of view that you have. Like I said, when you're moving your head around, it's actually watching in every direction. So there's some sample videos we have of things like uh, you know, Cirque du Soleil or you know, flying in a helicopter going over um, volcanoes in Hawaii, those sorts of things. And you actually feel like you're right there and wherever you look is, is really the camera has that 360 view around it. Um, the, um, the display itself, and I think we've talked about that. One interesting area as well that's coming up with this is that because the phone itself has a camera there, there's also the opportunity to develop what's called AR or augmented reality. And so how do you start layering digital information into a world where you're actually seeing out? So again, these are brand new technologies and everyone, uh, you would have all heard of Google Glass, I yeah, presume. So it's that idea, but a far more uh, in-depth digital experience as far as AR goes. So there's that as well. Are you gonna put two cameras in? Good question. I'd say for the moment, one. Uh, we'll see how these products evolve. Um, we have a, uh, the Galaxy uh, S6 is about to be released, which is a new new phone, um, and that's going to have VR. Uh, that's already been confirmed. So there's definite push in Samsung to push VR uh, and accessories. I think if there's an appetite in the market, uh, we'll see more. Um, these headsets are still regarded as developer ones. This is still very brand new technology, so there's a lot of room to play with it. Um, and I think if there's a, a, a clear need for that, it'll come back. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so VR anywhere, as, as I said, I think it's important to be the, the Oculus story. So you have the Oculus Rift over there that your, um, the, the aquarium already has the Oculus Rift. Uh, so this has been a long time development, uh, famously purchased by Facebook for several million dollars and now done in leveraging that technology onto the device. There are a variety of different VR um, systems out there, and you, I think you're going to see this area grow. So it's a great place to be in terms of thinking what can actually be done in the space. Uh, two microphones? Two microphones? On the device, the device would have, well, it depends. A lot of these uh, devices have a single microphone on them, yeah. so they would just have the one, but there's also yeah. sensors to, yeah. to do that. I'm just not sure if that's incorporated into developing the content. So yeah, that's a device. And, and uh, it's probably worth noting when I say content is that we have this hardware as Samsung. We've gone with Oculus, we've got this great hardware. The story is content. The story is how, what can be built, how will it be used, how will it be applied. And it's really a new area. And that's where um, Stefan specializes in as well. So he can talk some more to advice on how that can go, where that can be seen. Yep, thanks. In terms of what's already loaded on there for content, a lot of the stuff, as I said before, is uh, quite consumer focused and we're already seeing some opportunities in B2B. Um, but right now it's very much around those experiences under the ocean uh, and, uh, and video uh, where you're, you're in a moving environment or else it's photos. You actually have the capability even with this to take photos, stitch them together and actually put on VR headset and be in the middle of a photo. So it can actually do all of that right now just with the phone in your hand. So it's a really simple, easy application and depends what you want to do, where production values, um, production values go up a lot. Depending on what you want to do, you can do a lot with it. Uh, gaming is obviously another big application. Now how that could look in an education setting is interesting, but actually starting to build out some different functionalities, functionalities around gaming experiences as well as interesting. I know I've spoken with another university where they have uh, software engineering labs where students are doing a lot of games development and so on, and they see this as interesting. How far advanced are you already with the augmented reality stuff? Augmented reality right now is, I would say, I, there is, so with all of our, what we have, everything from Samsung is on open platform, whether it's Android most famously, but ties in, but also with this, the software development kits are shared. I understand there's an initial developer software kit as far as starting to work through some, some AR technologies, but it is still in its infancy. So has anyone stitched stuff? And, <coughs> and for AR? In AR? I have not seen it yet, but it could exist. I could follow up for you and find out. Um, I'm happy to, to the, is that something that um, they're looking oh, it's at? Just, you can be immersed in an environment that feels totally immersive, but if it may not match 
exactly to the external environment. And yep. you need that if you're going to augment the external environment. Absolutely, and absolutely. You've got all those latency and the, uh, you want two cameras, you want two yeah, full headphones and you want to be immersed. Yeah, and I would say the push on this product right now initially is that VR. And, you know, I've even had people, VR rather than AR. Rather than AR. I think that capability is there, though, with a pass-through camera. It's just starting with it, um, leveraging that, you know, the cameras that they're, they're putting in these phones now are such high-resolution cameras that there's a lot of capability. Uh, but really wearing a VR now, you want to be sitting down in a swivel chair because you won't know where you are. Uh, you'll know once you try on a pair. Uh, yep, thanks, John. Next slide. Uh, so just talking a little bit about where we're at as far as what we've done I broadly in, in sort of looking at business applications, and I will bring this to education, don't worry. I'm just sort of just painting a picture a little bit about going from, um, from the world of consumers. So uh, it started with Qantas, looking at ways they could do something different with their customers. So they actually developed content in conjunction with Samsung for first-class passengers. So. Uh, any of the first class passengers in their first class lounge can sit and watch, you know, and you could just watch a movie or you can have, uh, they have a whole series of whole tourism experiences. So you actually can be in the middle of, uh, I think it's Kakadu National Park is one and there's, there are several other sites that are sort of world famous sites around Australia where you can experience Australia in a virtual reality setting. Um, they will also be putting it on board the plane. Um, I'm going to be interested in that because if you're wearing virtual reality in a moving space, uh, there's, there could be some issues around that. So I'll, I'll, we'll see how that looks. But it's an interesting application. That only got uh, announced uh, within the last month, uh, that partnership. But we're seeing a lot of interest in that sense. Uh, next slide, please, John. Uh, another company that has looked into this is AGL. They have training centers where they have people. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll make a connection here with education in a moment. but. Um, they have a training center, new staff come in who work in the call center and as part of their uh, company induction, just getting a sense of the whole company and what it's like. Obviously being in, in, in the utility sector, there's a lot of remote hazardous areas, so staff actually get a tour around all of the different sites of AGL, actually get to see a lot of different things going on there. Um, for me, I, I think it'd be interesting in an education sense looking at how do you take students out of the classroom? How, how do you actually take them to those remote and hazardous places where there can be application? And there's an interesting content story there. Um, that's, that, that's an interesting application that's pretty straightforward and, and um, Stefan uh, was involved in creating the content for that. So that's an interesting space, uh, absolutely. Uh, yep, thanks. <clears throat> This is another one that's, uh, that's, that's moving in a fast space, and certainly those in the, uh, involved in sports uh, are quite excited by this one, is actually looking at creating the content uh, suited to a sports, and, uh, sports environments for live broadcasts, where you actually have the content created specifically by cameras that build out the content directly for VR. Um, the challenge of VR right now is, is, is probably the bandwidth more than anything. The amount of information you're gonna need to push down the line to do this is enormous. So a lot of it's network capabilities to actually do these sorts of things. I've spoken with a couple of universities. Stefan, welcome. <laughs> That's okay. I've told everyone your traumas on the Monash Freeway. <clears throat> yep, all good. Uh, so as far as those sorts of sports broadcasts, uh, that will be an interesting space. And just seeing about that content creation, there's a few different ways, but the technology to actually build out the content and actually capture all the content is a really interesting space right now. I think there's a few companies that use, you know, a, a, what, like 12 GoPro cameras will be strapped on something to, just to try to capture all that information. If you think about how much is coming down the line, it's enormous. Um, I've spoken one university that is thinking about uh, live streaming graduation ceremonies because often there's, particularly with international students going overseas, etc., getting to feel like they're there at graduation ceremonies can be something of interest. These, these are the sorts of ideas that are getting spitballed right now, how to, how to live broadcast these sorts of things. Uh, next, John. So one thing to answer that challenge Samsung has developed is uh, something called Project Beyond, which is a camera that actually has the capability to, um, just for, forgive me for a moment, um, a camera that actually has the ability to capture this material or this content actually this sort of level. Could you switch to input two again for me? 
Let's just make sure it captures up. So 16 HD cameras, it's the only way I can actually do that full view. So that's a, um, that's a little bit of a view of what we're actually working on developing. That's going to be released to market, uh, expecting either later this year or early next year. Uh, yep. Is there any, that's sort of one set camera? Yes. Again, so we're simulating one pupillary distance sort of average? Or? Uh, yes, I think it, it, it just sort of. No, this is this is like this. This has been announced at our developer conference late last year. So this is, again, you know, we sort of we have the consumption device now. Now we're looking at the technologies to actually help create the content. And certainly, uh, I know Stefan can can speak to um, what's involved with that. But as you can see, the sort of you know, you've got 16 HD inputs all at once happening. So giggle gigapixel was it per second uh, so an enormous amount of information so I think to add additional cameras we're probably yes from my experience, there's a, a slight variation in regards to your perspective. When you, your IPD is different from whatever the IPD yep. is, soon when you're recording content. So in the high-tech training area, that might be critical. Mm. So yeah. just a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be, be nice if there was a sort of a, a average human eye separation version and a um, exaggerated stereo Why? version as well. Why? <laughs> <laughs> when you're in an environment where things are a long yeah. way from you that there's no stereoscopic information beyond 30 meters. Yeah. And so sometimes I want to kind of hide the stereo. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed in one of the examples you had there, there were things obviously happening in the background with these birds flying around and stuff like that. So how long would you film that for so that somebody standing there can look around and you know, have a that's a kind of a, I, I would say it, it depends. I don't know what the optimal length of content will be. I'm looking at Stefan because he might be able to. Uh, we have found if it's longer than 10 seconds, people tend to lose interest. If there's not really something going on, you don't have a directed experience. Okay, so they're just going to have a look around and then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like what's going on? 10 seconds, you know, if you count from 1 to 10, it's, you know, you're looking around in the room, that's enough to really get a good idea. Yeah. So that, that's definitely an emerging area is how, how to actually create content in these areas. That's something that we're working on right now. And we are committed with, with these devices and really leveraging these devices to make VR a lot more accessible. Um, I've been to a couple of universities that have VR caves that are really cool. I don't, I don't know if, uh, does Swinburne have a? We, have, a, we have a flat screen, single large format. Right, gotcha. And it's, it's sort of curved yeah, around with? Just flat, okay, gotcha. So I've been in them, they're, they're great, um, but they tend to be very expensive, hard to get any time in, and, and difficult to use. So the idea is taking the content to people, making it easy to access, and that's what we're really focused on and what we're doing as far as helping, helping enable those things. But um, that was most of what I wanted to cover myself. Um, I, um, 
just will I will probably need a little bit of time just to transition over to Stefan so he can he can set up. So if you just give us a moment, please, we'll just uh, we'll just switch things over. If that's okay. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Um, there was a, a pretty bad accident in the in the Burnley Tunnel. I spent two and a half hours coming from Geelong here, and I, I found a parking spot just outside, so I was pretty lucky. Went for the tallest building. I thought there are not many level nine buildings in here, and that logic didn't fail me. So I was pretty good. Um, so I, I'm, I have seen the presentation before in another event, so I, I think there's not going to be too much overlap. Um, my name is Stefan Perner. I'm the managing director of Virtual Reality Ventures, which is uh, specializing in immersive content creation, application development, and consulting to corporate clients specif specifically for virtual reality. Um, we are the um, first virtual reality service partner for Samsung globally, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. I'm also the president of AVRIA, which is the Australian Virtual Reality Industry Association. And, um, here to talk to you about virtual reality in education, but not just in education, but also I want to touch on a couple other topics surrounding marketing and data visualization, which are tangentially re related to what you're trying to do here, but not purely educational, I guess. Would you mind going to the next slide? Uh, just a little bit of history here. The same technology that you find in the, in the Gear VR, which is over here, has actually been invented by a 19-year-old kid about three years ago called Palmer Lucky. And uh, he started a Kickstarter, uh, made two and a half million dollars in it, only asking for a, a quarter of a million dollars, and uh, created the Oculus Rift. Uh, next one, please. Uh, they, they got uh, $16 million in Series A funding just several months later. Next, it's going to be pretty rapid. Um, then $75 million Series B by Andreessen Horowitz, who've also been behind the Netscape uh, browser in the early internet days. Next one. And then we bought for $2 billion a year ago by Facebook, which uh, was a bit of a shock. Um, I founded the company in January last year and thought it would, you know, somehow will come from it sometime, somehow. But with Facebook putting $2 billion into the technology, that was really a bit of a shock for us. Uh, next. Sony announced the Morpheus for the PlayStation 4 in the same month. Next. Google uh, came out with the cardboard. This one here, and I have another one over there that I can show you in a minute. Basically, you put your phone in there. Everybody can spend you know, $5 on a piece of cardboard, put your phone in it, and you have virtual reality right now. Of course, not as good as this one. Uh, next, please. Then Google invests half a billion dollars in a company called Magic Leap. You have, have you, anybody here heard about Magic Leap at all? Yeah, so it seems to be pretty cool, um, but it's a bit of a con controversial company, more into the augmented reality space than virtual reality. Um, nobody really knows what it's about. People say there's a joke, there's an insider joke in the community that goes something like this. You know, if you have heard about, uh, if you wanted to have a look at that, if you have heard about Magic Leap, and if you haven't heard about Magic Leap, your level of information is about the same. Um, so we're all, pretty, we're all pretty interested to understand what they actually are going to do, and, and we don't know. But Google put half a billion dollars in it, so my assumption is it's, it's going to be something interesting. Next. And then, of course, earlier this year in January, uh, Microsoft announces the HoloLens, which is going to be completely integrated into uh, Windows 10, another augmented reality uh, set of glasses. And of course, Samsung uh, then released the Gear VR in Australia, and that is the very first consumer available uh, virtual reality device uh, at, a, at a reasonable consumer price point, so several hundred bucks. The device there is $250, if I remember that correctly, and the phone that goes into it to enable the experience, which is, which is it isn't right now, um, costs about $800. Although I'm sure there's special swimmer in prices there, <laughs> if, I, if I would have to guess. Yeah. Next one, please. And then Valve. Have you guys heard about Valve? Valve is a, is a gaming platform, about 120 million users. They teamed up with a company called HTC, which you might have heard of, heard of to produce, um, where this is a mobile experience. This is aimed at uh, you know, it's, it's a tethered experience. 
uh, seems to be quite incredible as well. I haven't personally experienced it. Um, uh, it's slated for release later this year. Uh, next one, please. And then just very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, really, uh, Samsung announced that, um, and I think we're see, starting to see a bit of a pattern here, is that with the S6, with the Samsung Galaxy S6 and the Edge, there's going to be a, a, a particular Gear VR version as well. And it, it seems to me like the way that the technology is being received at the moment, we can expect um, that in the not too distant future, every smartphone is going to be released with some kind of a virtual reality device attached to it. So this is going to be, um, this is going to be coming uh, very shortly, as far as I'm concerned. Next one. Um, aside from you know, the, the Facebooks and the Samsungs and the Microsoft and the Googles of the world, there's a whole zoo of you know, other ones there that are looking to capitalize on the same wave. You see here Samsung Gear VR is here. Carl Zeiss is doing something here. German company Dorovis Dive. Um, the Fove does eye tracking, for example. Uh, Alter Gaze, Vervana, you start to lose track really. But there's several dozen uh, headsets either in the pipeline or already available that you can do either augmented or virtual reality uh, experiences with. You might remember the Viewmaster. The Viewmaster, that thing? So Google and Mattel are actually teaming up to bring that into the virtual reality age. They are making it a, basically a, a smartphone holder where you can have you know, immersive experiences using that old, that old brand. Apple is the big question mark at the moment. We know that they have received a couple of patents in that space and that they're hiring as well. But what exactly it is that they are doing is anybody's guess at the moment. But I, I don't think they're going to miss that boat. I think they're going to do what they usually do. They, you know, uh, keep quiet, make a big splash, and then suddenly VR is a thing, right? When it's going to happen, I don't know. But I guess sometime this year or latest early next year. Uh, next one, please. These here are a number of brands who have used uh, virtual reality for marketing. I think we are in the um, marketing stunt phase of VR for a number of reasons. First of all, roughly less. I would say, if you ask me, and I don't have any numbers that are hard figures, but I would say you know, less than 1% of people have so far experienced the latest generation VR, such as what you can experience with the, with the Gear VR. And people who do experience uh, uh, that level of virtual reality usually don't forget their first experience. It's a, it's a wow moment. Who here has actually tried the Gear VR so far? Who hasn't tried the Gear VR so far? OK, that makes perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> just, just trying to make sure. Um, the thing with VR, you can't overhype it. You can't overpromise on it. It's really strange. It's one of those things. Virtual reality, I say, is not only better than you imagine, it's better than you can imagine. It's incredible. And you're all going to have a chance to try it out very shortly. Um, perfect for marketing. If you can associate that kind of an experience with your brand, for example, Swinburne, one of those events overseas that you know where you look for international students to join your campus why not exploit that to a degree and these companies have done so already next please um, growth projections very difficult to make predictions uh, especially about the future um, when you have here uh, we talk about how many units you can expect to be uh, in the marketplace within the next several years. Some people say 11 million by 2016. Um, others say 55 by 2020. Facebook, who has bought Oculus for $2 billion and have hired 1,200 engineers specifically for virtual reality content, they are saying that they expect about 50 to 100 million headsets in the market within the next roughly 10 years. The consensus seems to be that based on the experience that people can have with this, 
And of course, at the moment, you're, you know, you're kind of wondering, what is this experience? Uh, but the consensus seems to be that the growth rates here are going to be larger than that of the original iPhone. Uh, some say by a factor of five. Uh, next, please. The consumer wave, the big consumer wave, is going to start by the end of this year. At the moment, Samsung is, and I'm speaking for, for Samsung here a little bit, um, Samsung is marketing this as an innovator's edition. That means, well, let's test the waters, let's see what's going on. They're having trouble keeping up with supplying units right now. I think that's fair to say, is it? It is fair to say. And that's, of course, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it's, it's somehow it's a good problem to have. Um, and from the people that I speak to, um, I ask them, are you going to buy this? And they say, yeah, I'm going to buy this. And it's people that you wouldn't expect um, to, to necessarily buy these kind of uh, technologies. So it's not necessarily the IT geeks. It's just people who have almost transformational experiences uh, putting these things on. And that's, that's not different to what happened to me. When I tried virtual reality for the first time in the end of 2013, I was, at that point in time, the chief information officer for a retail group. You know, Australia Frontline Stores. You might not have heard about it. Um, it's uh, helping independent Australian retailers compete with the big boys. I put it on and it was not even half as good as this. And I had a, I, I had a transformational experience. I quit my job and I'm now, and since then I've been doing virtual reality full time and not looking bad. Um, next please. This is Gartner's hype cycle. Um, they have released that in 2014. The big blue dot over here is where they see virtual reality. I couldn't disagree with them more. They say we have just passed the peak of inflated expectations, just coming out of the throw of disillusionment and now slowly climbing the slope of enlightenment. I think we are very much to the left of uh, uh, the peak of inflated expectations, simply because so few people have even tried it. Um, and that nobody here, well, aside, of course, from Brett and myself, has tried it. That tells me that very few people have tried it, you know. Um, and I think this is going to be revised somewhere uh, to the left of the peak in the 2015, if not the 2016, um, hype cycle release. And I'm in touch with Gartner um, at the moment, uh, trying to, you know, get an awareness for this, because a lot of them haven't tried it. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to make these kind of charts when you're actually not having tried this. And of course, what people are thinking about here is the short-lived VR boom of the 90s that fizzled out quite spectacularly. But this time is different. Well, diff difficult sentence, this time is different, right? Every time is different. Um, but this time is different in the sense that the units are at a consumer price point, several hundred dollars, not several hundred thousand dollars. The experience doesn't make you sick. And the tools to create the experiences are virtually free. Uh, it's just a matter of actually making use of them and coming up with content. Uh, next, please. Um, well, my specialty, among other things, is corporate applications of virtual reality. I don't expect you to read all of this. It's just a bit of an overview. If any of these topics we are not covering today, for example, we're not talking about um, fashion. I, I didn't find that very relevant for you. We don't, we're not talking about tourism necessarily. But if any of you have an interest in any of those other areas that I'm not covering today, please let me know, and I will make sure to make these uh, slides available to you. Um, next, please. Um, one of the... Uh, killer apps, early killer apps, is real estate. I'm talking, um, doing consulting right now for the RIA group, for example. Imagine if you wanted to pre-visualize the next building. You have, large, you have a lot, I don't know, I'm imagining how universities work, right? Um, you're having a, a, a big donor um, putting money into a new building. They want to make sure it's exactly how they envision it. You know, do a, do a VR experience for them. And then you probably can't go wrong. Uh, next. Construction engineering. Um, I 
One of the interesting aspects of the Gear VR is that not only can you have fully immersive virtual experiences, but you can use the pass-through camera and markers to uh, generate augmented, immersive augmented reality experiences. So again, if you wanted to build uh, you know, a new environment or you want to set up a new lab or something along those lines, you pre-create it, pre-visualize it in virtual reality, put a couple of markers on the wall, for example, put the gear VR on, and then you can actually be in the space and see how the space is going to look like once all the constructions uh, have been finished, once the equipment is in the room, et cetera, et cetera. And then go through and say, well, that's too narrow or that's too wide or, or something like that. Talking about using the pass-through camera in the past, so it, at this stage, it's still very early development as far as using a pass-through camera for these sorts of functionalities. Yes, it is quite early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's quite early. I have an example that I can show you if you're interested, but it's 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 it is quite early. It's a bit R and D at the moment. Uh, next one, please. Events. Um, Brett, you've spoken about graduations, right? If somebody can't be there, you can. Um, recorded in VR or live stream it in VR. Um, there was uh, one which I think was really interesting approach to it. There was uh, uh, a live stream of a, of a birth in Perth to a mine worker in northern Queensland, 4,000 kilometers apart. And this is something you can, you know, at the moment it's, it's still quite an effort to get something like this set up, but once project beyond is becoming available, then it should be relatively simple to do these kind of things graduations, maybe somebody wants to see how an exam is going, put a project beyond in there, and you can, you can monitor that, just look in, look around and see what's going on. Uh, next, please. Um, I mentioned marketing before. Um, it's not only that it is a bit of a stunt, but actually there are, and this is all based on peer-reviewed journal articles, that um, consumers who are experiencing products in VR actually prefer them over products that they have experienced on normal 2D screens. So there are some real benefits beyond the, va the wow of the, uh, of the technology as well. Uh, next one, please. Data visualization, uh, big data. Uh, there's so much data going around, um, which is difficult to really make a lot of sense of. With VR, you're not only looking at a small screen about you know, this size, if you're lucky, about this far away somewhere but you can, have, you can look all the way around you. Um, I did some consulting for McKinsey and Company about augmented reality applications in the petrochemical and semiconductor industry, for example. And what that means is that, or what, what you can do in these kind of uh, applications is, you can take all the data that you're gathering with all your sensors, and that, that, that can be you know, research activities or, you know, um, live information gathered from you know, tweets that are location bound or whatever you want to do, you, know, you overlay that over a map of the situation or over the actual equipment, and then you don't have to look on a computer screen to see what the readouts are, but you can actually see it in the actual situation, for example. Uh, next one, please. Healthcare, uh, think about exposure therapy. Uh, for example, you know, if people are afraid of spiders or flying. Uh, you know, if, if you are doing exposure therapy um, you, and you're, you're treating people who are afraid of, of uh, spiders, for example, until now you would have to have a terrarium somewhere, feed them, you know, make sure nothing goes wrong, you know, what, what happens if they get out of control, etc., etc. In VR, you just program it as a virtual experience. You have total control over the situation, don't have to worry about these things anymore. Phantom limb theory, um, uh, not theory, phantom limb uh, uh, is, is a real problem. So you're probably all aware what happens sometimes. People lose a limb, for example, an arm, but it's still painful, right? But not only that, it also, phantom limbs can also get stuck. So you, you can imagine that in the person's own percep percep uh, perception, they have lost the limb, but the limb is actually stuck somehow, somehow awkwardly like this. And what that causes them to actually go through doors sideways uh, some, of, some of the times. And what you can do in VR is you can attach motion sensors to your, for example, if you lost your right arm, attach motion sensors to your left arm. And then you give instructions in VR where 
um, the patient suffering from phantom limb symptoms is instructed to move their arm in synchronicity. And because you are mirroring what the left arm is doing in VR to a virtual right arm, and you're getting this visual feedback, uh, phantom limbs can get unstuck, uh, and it can help with pain, etc. cetera. Um, applications in dementia, uh, disability, PTSD treatments are all areas that could help. Um, keyhole surgery, notoriously difficult to train for. Um, if, if you could do training in that area with VR, uh, that can help quite a bit, yes. For that sort of surgery, you really do need the fine control over unless all you're doing is getting an idea of what it, what it might feel like rather than actually how to do it. You would need really fine control over the, the sensory experience. So you'd need control over... You need very, very specific IPD measurements and so on, yeah. So are we at that stage yet, or...? Um, in uh, keyhole surgery, what you, would what, we, what you would do is you would have a complete virtual experience and then you can set up the IPD to whatever you want it to be. So you wouldn't, have been, you wouldn't be restricted to a physical device to record so a particular you scenario. As well, so that you get the, the um, feedback, I would have to look into the, those particular uh, yeah. examples that we took this information from. But yeah, there would be haptic feedback in regards yeah. to you know the, the measurements, uh, not the measurements, the instruments, yeah. and, and and how it would feel like, etc. Maybe incorporated into your headgear space or not? Um, well, I'm I'm talking not not particularly about the gear VR yeah. now with this particular application. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not aware that there has been something been done with the Gear VR in that space, but virtual reality in general, that's something that is definitely possible. Yeah, hap haptics is definitely an area. I've seen a lot of R&D going in uh, around with a few universities right now about how to do that yeah. as well, and then how do you incorporate that so you can see your hands when you got the VR on? Yeah. 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 So, yes, I'd, I'd say it's still, these are all very new emerging things. It's still on the far left of the, the curve, yeah. I would say, yeah, it's, it's mm. new. I mean, I've seen the Stefan says as well, but I would suggest, yes, this is brand new stuff. Because you've got not only surgery, but you think about um, de demolition uh, of bombs in defense or things like this. There's all kinds of ways in which you need to have practice these things in a way that's safer. So, so Stefan. A lot of the research is done using technology that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I see no reason why they shouldn't be applicable to the new consumer level VR, which now is actually better than what you could have bought for any money just about five years ago. Um, yep, so much for that. Um, next one, please. And then there's, of course, the education and training space, um, where, um, you know, there's this, this particular paper here um, says that, or had the result that. Uh, you know, that virtual reality trained residents made six times fewer interoperative errors and performed the particular procedure 30 times faster when dissecting um, the gallbladder from the liver bed. So that's a very specific uh, example where there's some really good uh, results uh, demonstrated. Um, it, you know, the, the experience itself, just because people talk, when they put it on, uh, people talk about, you know, in terms of I am you know, here or there, or I'm standing on top of a mountain, or I'm in a building or something like this. So it is not like I'm looking at something, but I am somewhere. And that her helps with learning, with memory recall, uh, uh, et cetera. One of the things is, you know, when, it, when it comes to training, imagine you are having very delicate or very expensive equipment that in the real world would cause, you know, uh, serious trouble if uh, you, you would something would go wrong during a training exercise or it would just cost a lot of money to occupy these uh, these pieces of equipment just simply for training if you do that in virtual reality you don't have you only have a fraction of these costs uh, self fa say failing if something goes wrong it's not a disaster you can go through what actually has happened during the uh, training exercise and then give feedback and improve from there. Um, next one, please. Producing VR experiences, just simply because it is a new medium, is a bit tricky. You a lot of things that need to be considered. First of all, from a content creation perspective, 
uh, imagine in, you know, up until now, and probably for, for quite a long time into the future, over there there's a camera, you point it in one direction, it doesn't matter what happens outside that camera's field of view. Right? In virtual reality, when you do 360 video, for example, there is no such thing as out of frame. Everything is in frame. Right? That means the crew, the director, everything else, it's, it's all there. Um, the next thing is cinematography. Certain things just don't work in VR. You know, if you accelerate, for example, and you have that visual feedback, but you don't get the feedback from your uh, vestibular system, it makes you quite sick. Same is true from turning and some other, uh, other things that, well, they just need to be considered quite closely. Can I just comment there that a lot of these problems have been uh, solved by the planetarium community, who's been doing full dome video projection techniques for about 15 or 20 years. Uh, and, and they have the same issue of, you know, a dome is surrounding you, content is all directions, where does the audience look? And you'd be surprised, but they find most of the time you have to just put the action in front of you because people don't want to spend 40 minutes doing that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, very true. And all of these problems can be solved, but a lot of people are just not aware of what they're doing when they're making certain camera movements in VR, and then they, they put it on, on the headset, and it just makes them terribly sick. The planetarium just solves all these issues around how to do transitions, how to fast to move, how to draw the audience attention if you do want them to move, to move elsewhere. And it's not just for astronomy in the last probably 10 years. The full dome festivals um, have been drawing artists in to look at different filmmaking um, experiences, different environments, ways of telling, you know, sort of a version of Romeo and Juliet that was essentially done as the first uh, feature, non-science full dome thing, and that was 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah. I encourage you to look to the, look to the full dome festival. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. And I'm not saying these problems can't be solved. I'm just saying a lot of it is a new challenge for a lot of people. So what I'm, what I'm seeing, for example, is that a lot of traditional videographers, they're trying to get into that field, and then they're, they're doing certain things that they're used to in their traditional medium, and it just doesn't work. But that, that's, a good, that's a really good point. The next one is storytelling, immersive storytelling. Um, and uh, the thing with a new medium is that uh, imagine when radio was just being just just hitting up on the emergence of television and certain the first thing that people have done uh, with with television was they basically dressed up the radio presenters and and placed the camera on them pointed a camera on the radio show and then that was that was then tv but of course um it, it doesn't really take full advantage of what you can do with 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 that new medium and it took you know many decades many decades to really figure out the language of, of TV and, and, and what works and what doesn't work. I'm talking to a number of other universities at the moment as well, and one of the things that they told me, and this is just an example, is, well, VR, yes, great, we need to get our lecture theater in VR. Right? And then I'm saying, well, that would just be like pointing uh, a camera on the radio show, if you do that. Because the only reason you have a lecture theater the way that you have it right now is because you have certain re constraints in terms of you know, how much money you can spend to build it, you know, what kind of shape it can have, the location it is in, et cetera, et cetera. What, how would your lecture theater look like if you didn't have any of those constraints? And that is really how you need to think about these things when it comes to virtual reality. And then, of course, playback. Um, with uh, a camera like, like, like this, for example, you point it somewhere, you shoot it, you upload it on YouTube. That's it, right? very simple. Doing something similar with the Gear VR at the moment is not, not really straightforward, simply because it is a new medium and not all of these things have been figured out uh, just yet how to do properly. So these are, the, as, as I see it, the four, you know, the four things to really consider when you're producing VR experiences. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, and that's really the end of, of my presentation. Um, again. Uh, specializing in immersive content creation, application development consulting to corporate clients specifically for virtual reality. Thank you. This has been a Swinburne production. 